We welcome all that are watching on video tonight. Glad to have you with us. I appreciate Steve taking my place this morning. And uh, we needed a little R&R after uh, the events in our home. And so we're thankful for the opportunity to do that. Uh, we spent a couple of days in West Virginia State Parks and we spent uh, today at Shawnee State Park uh, in Portsmouth and had a good time in both places. Well, let's open our Bibles to Hosea chapter 7. Hosea chapter 7. And we're really going to start reading in 6.11, because 6.11 goes with 7.1. So let's connect that with this chapter. Um, so 6.11. Also, O Judah, he has set a harvest for thee when I returned the captivity of my people. When I would have healed Israel, then the iniquity of Ephraim was just uncovered and the wickedness of Samaria, for they commit falsehood, and the thief comes in, and the troop of robbers spoil without. And they consider not in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. Now their own doings have beset them about. They are before my face. They make the king glad with their wickedness, and the princes with their lies. They're all adulterers, like an oven heated by the baker, who ceases from raising after he's netted the dough until it be leavened. In the day of our king, the princes have made him sick with skins of wine. He stretched out his hand with the scoffers, for they made ready their heart like an oven while they lie in wait. Their baker sleeps all the night. In the morning it burns like a flaming fire. They're all hot as an oven and have devoured their judges. All their kings are fallen. There's none among them that calls on me. Ephraim has mixed himself among the people. Ephraim is a cake, not turned. Strangers have devoured his strength, and he knows it not. Yea, gray hairs are here and there upon him, yet he knows it not. And the pride of Israel testifies to his face, and they do not return to the Lord their God, nor seek him for all of this. Ephraim also is like a silly dove without heart. They call to Egypt, they go to Assyria. When they shall go, I will spread my net upon them. I will bring them down like fowls of the heavens. I will chastise them as their congregation hath heard. Woe to them, for they fled from me. Destruction to them, because they've transgressed against me. Though I've redeemed them, yet they've spoken lies against me. And they have not cried to me with their heart. When they wailed upon their beds, they assemble themselves for grain and wine and rebel against me. Though I abound and strengthen their arms, yet they do imagine mischief against me. They return, but not to the Most High. They're like a deceitful bow. Their princes fall by the sword for the rage of their tongue, and this shall be their derision in the land of Egypt. Let's uh, have a word of prayer, and we'll get started tonight. Father, bless us as we come to this very colorful and yet very painful chapter in the history of the Jewish nation 2,700 years ago that has so many similarities with our own time. It's almost embarrassingly shocking. And so, Father, bless us as we come and may you teach us tonight from your word. Give me grace to speak and each of us grace to hear and bless each one that's listening in Jesus name amen. amen our daughter Andrea is getting ready to leave for uh, Bible College and that will happen August 15th so next Sunday will be her last Sunday with us before she takes off and um, she's collecting books already to study in preparation for some of the courses she signed up for and one of them was a Old Testament introduction book written by a fellow by the name of Paul Benware. And he got a doctorate from Grace. I didn't know him uh, when I was there, at least I don't think I did. 
And uh, yet, he had a pretty good outline of Hosea in that book that I liked. And I noticed the NIV Study Bible uh, has a similar outline expanded. But his outline was Hosea 1 to 3, the unfaithful wife, and Hosea 4 to 14, the unfaithful nation. That's a pretty good outline. There's a real break there uh, between the 1 to 3 and 4 to 14. And uh, this, he, he remarks, this prophecy was the last voice to the northern kingdom. This was it. And just a couple of decades and it's over. And uh, so, but the NIV study Bible expands it. Uh, the unfaithful wife and the faithful husband, one to three. The unfaithful nation and the faithful God, four to 14. So those are excellent outlines because they cover the natural divisions of the book. And I concur with all of that. But I do see within the second part, uh, real divisions that can and should be noticed, even though we realize those two broader divisions. So our outline was one to three is surprised by hope, four to eight searched by holiness, a nine and 10 scattered by providence, and 11 to 14 saved by love. And so uh, as we come to that, we're in that searched by holiness section where the all-knowing eyes of the Holy God are giving the nation a spiritual MRI. And we've already developed this since chapter four, four, five, six, and now we're in seven with the same thing. And clearly, the God of heaven knows about his unfaithful nation better than they know themselves. And chapter seven is kind of more of the same. It's humbling for us to realize that God sees things in them and in us we don't see in ourselves, right? Um, we had a book in our library and I was trying to get it to, and I, missed, I don't know where it went, it's gone, the church library. It's a biography of Louis Pasteur, the famous French scientist of the 19th century. He was so nearsighted he had to have wear glasses to get around his laboratory. So things at a distance at all were blurred to him, but he was extremely nearsighted so he could see things up close that other people would miss. And I remember reading in that biography that he would often sit at the table and pick at his bread. And he would see a fly's leg in the bread or a little piece of mold or something else that, and he just, he'd pick it, but they, <laughs> he'd be doing that because he had such eye, good eyesight, and he could see things that other people, they just gobble down the bread and don't see anything. Uh, a fascinating uh, story. And uh, in light of that story, some believe, uh, some very scholarly commentaries, Garrett and uh, I believe Anderson and Friedman believe the gray hair, and he doesn't know it, is really gray mold. That they're moldy and they don't know it. I don't hold that interpretation. I think it's fairly credible, but I, I go with the hair on the head one, but I just mentioned that. But the whole point is that God notices things we don't notice. God knows things we don't notice. And we got gray hair or gray mold and we don't notice, but God knows it. And this searching by holiness, God sees things and knows things about us that we are unaware about ourselves. And since Jesus is the God of heaven, our Lord Jesus sees and knows things about you and me we don't know about ourselves. Now, I'm sure if, I, if, if we were asked to give a list of sins, we could all have a pretty long list but that'd be a short list compared to God's list. If we listed, you know, a 10-page essay of sins, this is my sins, uh, God, God could have an encyclopedia size list. He notices what we don't notice. That's the whole point of, uh, of seven, uh, of uh, of, not, uh, of the whole thing, he's got gray hairs and he doesn't see them, but God sees them. 
Nothing in this creation is, is hidden from God's sight. Everything is, is, uh, un, 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 is, is uh, uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Pretty clear, isn't it? And 7.2 says, They consider not in their hearts, I remember all their wickedness. Now their own doings have beset them about. They're before my face. So God knows what they don't know, and God knows what we don't know about ourselves. Charles Feinberg said, of uh, uh, verses 6 to 11, uh, or 6, 11 and 7, 1, every attempt to redeem Israel only discloses more of its sinfulness. Search as he might, God could not discover repentance in his people. It is just unrepentant sin. It's like a surgeon, he goes in to get one thing and this he sees, wow, this is really bad. And the patient knows nothing about how bad the condition really is. Iron said, Ironside said, no sign of contrition for all their offenses uh, could the Holy Spirit, holy eyes detect only sin, lawlessness, deliberately persisted in, despite every entreaty to cease transgressions. In carnal security, they considered not in their heart, he remembered all their wickedness. Idolatry, having been introduced and never judged, permeated the entire nation. You know what the old saying is, a little leaven leavens a whole lump? Well, they had 200 and some years of leavening from the calves that were introduced by Jeroboam the first, and then the Baal worship introduced by Ahab, and the nation was really in bad, bad shape. Uh, I, I was at the dentist about a month ago, and this 80-year-old dentist was working on me. I think I told you about my molar. And I opened my mouth, and he looked inside, and he said, boy, you put a lot of money in your mouth, haven't you? <laughs> Which is true. I don't think I've got a tooth that hasn't been filled or pulled or crowned or something. And uh, that started when I was young, and it, it just has been what it is. And I probably got a couple of good-sized cars in, uh, worth of money in my mouth. And God wasn't surprised, though, when he looked into the heart of Israel. He knew it. He's all-knowing. And uh, they were a nation of intractables. Uh, we had a, I've told you about this boy at, in, in seventh grade or eighth grade, English class. I'll, I'll, I won't say his name because I remember it. I remember him for one thing. He is totally unteachable. And we had a wonderful English teacher. And this particular fellow, uh, he would come into class. His first name was Dick. I won't mention his last name. He'd come into class, put his head down and sleep, and there was no way you could get him to break, even move his head up. Every class it was the same. Totally, completely unteachable. And really, we have a nation of unteachables, intractables. Uh, one writer said, the Lord says when he looks at Israel, all he sees is guilt. Literally, their deeds surround them. Uh, you ever heard actors say, photograph me on my good side? Well, their evil deeds are surrounding them. They don't have a good side. No matter how God uh, looks at them from whatever angle and wherever he looks, they're surrounded by wickedness and there's no repentance or contrition to be found. Uh, another writer said, most surprisingly is the utter callousness of the people towards these sinful acts. They do not seem to realize that these deeds are evil. Apparently these sins are normal, acceptable behavior in their society. Since everyone seems to be doing them, they think nothing of these crimes and do not think God's paying any attention to them either. How many people have you ever heard say, I don't see anything wrong in that? 
and it might be something really bad. Or everybody does that. And we have a satanic liar that runs this cosmos that uh, uh, tries to impact God's people with that. This is the norm. You people are abnormal, not living this way or thinking this way. And so in 6.11, also, Judah, he has set a harvest for thee. When I return, when I would return, the captivity of my people. And I, he wanted to look for repentance and see it. When, would I have healed Israel? Then the iniquity of Ephraim was uncovered and the wickedness of Samaria. They commit falsehood. The thief comes in. The troop of robbers spoils without. And they consider not in their heart, I remember all their wickedness. Now their doings have been beset them around. They're before my face. So they're ignoring the Lord's keen perception. They act as if the Lord doesn't care, he's not seeing, or he's forgetful. That's what we got in chapter 7. We got a very serious situation. Now the Lord not only sees it, he sees it in a way to analyze it and picture it in a very colorful, memorable way. It's one thing to see it. It's another thing to see it and be able to analyze it and picture it in a way to communicate it to the people themselves and uh, so forth. But we're often blind to the sins that we have and the sins of our culture around us. Anyone that's ever traveled into another culture and come back, which What's your, uh, what's your um, experience? Well, one, you see a culture you, is doing things differently. These people are different. Some of the things are good, some of the things are bad, but they don't do them like we do it. And you assume everybody lives like you do, and then you find out, no, these people are a little different. But then when you come back to your own culture, what happens? You see well, my culture is not as normative as I thought it was. Because you come back and say, some of these people in this other culture do things better than we do. So we're not the end-all, know-all kind of people. Well, the Lord sees all these things, and he sees them very clearly, and he sees them clear enough to communicate. We've all had doctors that use $10 words we can't understand to describe our condition. It doesn't help us at all. Really. But if a doctor can make it very clear in words we understand, it's very penetrating. So what we have in chapter 7 is really amazing. These are some of the best similes or epigrams that Hosea comes up with. These are incredible figures of speech that draw a picture for us uh, that help us to penetrate uh, what God is saying. And like an airport scanner uh, that's detecting people smuggling stuff on a screen, uh, God, uh, God is able to see things that shouldn't be there, that are there, and that's, his, that's what's being searched by holiness is. We've already seen some of God's word pictures. Some of the most brilliant similes of Hosea are in this chapter. We've seen some earlier, a stubborn calf, and the morning cloud, very picturesque. But we're going to find some more tonight. And if we can just teach that section this way, I think it will be very, very helpful to us. Um, let's look at them. There's five of them. Number one, an overheated oven. An overheated oven. Now, when you, we say oven, you picture something in your kitchen, but the ovens then, Ogilvy uh, illustrates this, Hosea's day, an oven was about three feet in length, so cylindrical in form, with walls sloping to an open aperture at the top, kind of like an igloo, but not made of ice. <laughs> you know, it, 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 it's sloping at the top. And... The fire was set early morning, 
and an overheated oven would be flames leaping through the top. And the idea of those ovens would you put the fire in, heat it up, and then take the fire out when the walls were warm, and then put the bread in, slap the bread in on the sides of the oven. And pizza ovens work a little bit that way. And my son loves to build, James loves, he's, every place he goes, he builds a pizza oven in his backyard. I think he's built four. <laughs> he's getting pretty good at them. They're pretty big. And, but instead of going in the side, it goes from the top. And the picture here is an overheated oven is an oven that's not ready to be cooked anything good on. You've got to get it, you know, you've got to take the coals out, or as they do in Argentina, they move the coals to the side and just cook on the warm stone. So anyway, that's the picture. This is an out of control oven. And the picture in three to seven is people who are incapable of spiritual and moral responsibilities. They're out of control with their sinful passions. That's the picture in three to seven. Let me read it. And it's not the Holy Spirit that's guiding them, it's their sinful passions. They make the king glad with their wickedness and the princes with their lies. These are the northern kings, not one of them that was a good king. They're all adulterers, like an oven heated by the baker who ceases from rising after he's netted the dough until it leavens. In the day of our, of our king, the princes made him sick with skins of wine. That's either probably drugged wine or poisoned wine. He stretched out his hand with the scoffers. So the king's got a, in his court, are entertaining these people, and they're getting him either uh, drugged or, knocked or, or drunk so that they can kill him. And their passions are ruling them, not what's right or wrong. For they've made ready their heart like an oven while they lie in wait. Their baker, this is an intentional uh, inadvertence. Their baker sleeps all the night. In the morning it burns like a flaming fire. They're all hot as an oven and have devoured their judges. All their kings are fallen. There's none among them that calls on me. What a picture that is. Out of control, overheated oven. And so, uh, have you ever people have heard people talk about an old girlfriend or an old boyfriend as an old flame? Or I'm fired up about this political or this financial issue. I have a passion for that. Or burning with anger. That's what we're talking about. Sinful passions are just leading people or hothead. <laughs> so these people are into revolution and replacing leadership and so forth and so on. And uh, it's, a, it's a sad business. Ogilvy said, without knowledge of God and a relationship with him, our passions do flame like a flaming oven. And the palace was filled with plots and intrigue and power plays and assassinations. Listen to this by Dr. Bob Chisholm. Between 752 and 732, that's 20 years, four of Israel's rulers were assassinated. And the ones that assassinated him, that became the next king. So you got a king for a murder, and then somebody murders him, and then somebody murders him. I remember in the 60s, there was a string of assassinations, and many of you remember that. It was a very hard time for young people, a very disillusioning time for our country. We felt things are out of control. There's something evil going on. Uh, John Kennedy, in November 22nd, 1963, uh, Martin Luther King, April 4th, 1968, and Bobby Kennedy, June 6th, 1968. We had three very public people assassinated. One a president, and one an attorney general running for president, and, uh, and then a, a, a national leader, and then there were the Watts riots in 65, and then, then there was the Democratic National Convention in 68, and all the protests, and we think we got it bad. There were 12,000 Chicago policemen and National Guardsmen to control Chicago during the Democratic National Convention. And now we got it again. 
hot as an oven, out of control. And he says in verse 7, none of them calls on me. None of the kings were in for prayer. They were in for murder. Kind of goes back to 2.13, me, she forgot. So the first thing we see here is in this out of control oven is the nation was incapable of spiritual, if it's spiritual and moral responsibilities, they were totally out of control. Second, second, look in verse 8, Hosea 7, 8. Ephraim hath mixed himself among the people. Ephraim is a cake not turned. Ephraim is a cake not turned. Now, a lot of writers and preachers on this use the word half-baked to try this, but you know that's really not correct? I don't think. Many things that are half-baked, you can stick back in and bake bake them a little longer and fix it, right? You stick a needle in, or not a needle, a toothpick in, and there's raw in the middle, so you just put it in for a little longer. It might be half-baked, it's not done, so you put it in longer. So you can fix some things, and probably not all things, I'm no great cook, but you can fix some things that are half-baked if you catch them. This isn't half-baked. This is a piece of bread, or if you will, a pancake, and I've done it with pancakes and you have too. I'm sure you have, because I have. What happens when you leave a pancake on too long and you burn it on one side? It's burnt black on one side. And it's raw on the other side. Can you fix that? You can't fix that. Oh, you could flip it over. But who wants to eat it? What do you do in those cases? I'm not talking about a little bit of burn. I'm talking about burnt black. You've got to pitch it. It's raw on one side, burn on another. It's not fixable. Uh, I've done a lot of toast and stuff like that. Yeah, you scrape it off with a knife, the black part. There's some of those you can fix, but this is not something that's fixable. It's going to be unpalatable no matter what you do. It's an inedible mess. And why is it what it is? It's and there's a lot of answers. There's too much this and too much that, too much this and too much that. But verse 8, the context is Ephraim has mixed himself among the people. That's the phrase we have to look at to interpret the word picture. Ephraim is a cake not turned. What are we talking about here? It, it mixed himself among the people. It's a failure of separation. It's a failure of separation. And there's, a fa- there's an inattentiveness. They're not attentive to the issues of separation. And uh, it's an unfixable mess after 200 years of that. The little leavens leaven the whole lump. Uh, the cook has been inattentive to its business. Isn't that what's happened? You burn your pancake. You get distracted. You're doing other stuff. And you're not timing it. You're not, you know, I know how you look at a pancake. You're watching that dough, and you can kind of tell when it's ready to flip it. But you're not watching it. You're doing other stuff. And you, maybe you put the heat up too high, and you're not watching the dough, and it's time to flip, but you don't see it. So a, a cake not turned is a cake that hasn't received the attention that it needs to receive. The cook has been preoccupied, indifferent, diverted, inattentive. So a cake not turned is to be interpreted in light of mixing with the nations. They did not, they were not attentive, they were inattentive to the issues of separation. And they got into Baal worship under the name of Jehovah and mixing stuff, unbiblical lifestyles and goals and methods of operation, and it was so prevalent they didn't see the contradiction. It's this mixture with paganism that made them something different than God created them to be. How many of us as young people 
didn't know the Bible well enough, and I, I know it was me. I, didn't, I wasn't separated as a young person. I can't even tell you places I went on Saturday night, and then I went to church on Sunday morning. I was a cake not turned. I had no sense of separation. None. And what happened here is the mixture with paganism made Ephraim or Israel, however you want to entitle them, something different than God wanted them to be. They weren't a testimony to the nations. They were a disgrace. So here is a picture. They're ignorant of their decline. God sees what they don't see. They're incapable of their moral and spiritual responsibilities, one. They're inattent they are inattentive to separation, two. And now, third, they're ignorant of their decline. They've got gray hairs and they don't know it. They weren't as young as they thought they were. They didn't have the strength they thought they had. And that's the picture. There was a loss of power. Uh, one writer said, Israel did not heed the sign, that is gray hairs, but assumed she was still in the vigor of youth and able to care for her needs. Gray hair is saying death is closer than you think. You're not a young man anymore. You're not 18 anymore. Now, my dad was gray. I never knew my dad when he wasn't gray. Ever. He had, you know, gray hair at 30. He had white hair at 90. <laughs> he had gray hair at 30. I don't remember my dad when he wasn't gray. But he didn't have gray hair when he was 20. When he was a teenager, I've seen pictures of him. So the gray hair comes with time and with aging. And uh, the picture is you're over the hill and you don't know it. You're like Samson. You think you're in your prime and you're going to shake yourself and go out, but you're not what you used to be. Anderson Friedman said, Israel still harboring delusions about the game of international power politics. Actually, a nation was exhausted. And all that was not just them, that's us too, right? Often we have gray hairs and we don't notice. God sees what we don't see about ourselves. Fourth, the homing pigeon thing. <laughs> this is very clever. Well, let me, let me read the, the rest of it, verse 8. Ephraim has mixed himself among the people. The people there are Gentile peoples. Ephraim is a cake, not term. It's a failure of separation that made him so worthless. Strangers have devoured his strength and he knows it not. Yea, gray hairs are here and there on him and he knows it not. Other people can see it, he can't see it. When I started my second Bible class, a lot of the people, adults, were in their 30s, late 30s, early 40s. And I came back years later and I thought, about 20 years later, I thought, boy, these people are old, they all got gray hair. They really aged. Well, there's a lot of big difference between being late 30s and late 50s. Uh, and now when my wife cuts my hair, I see an awful lot of it. I'd see more if I had more, but. <laughs> and when I grow a beard, it's not that nice brown. I remember in 95, I grew a beard after not having one. And I had that dog gray muzzle right there, you know. Just there, the rest of it was still brown. Now it's gray. Just a little bit of brown. But they weren't seeing themselves, and therefore they didn't even see the decline of the nation, because economically they were doing great, better than at the time of Solomon. But spiritually they were they were not what they used to be. And so God goes on and says, he says, the pride of Israel testifies to his face. They do not return to the Lord their God nor seek him for all this. Ephraim is like a silly dove without heart. They call 
to Egypt, they go to Assyria. This is a homing pigeon that doesn't go home. It doesn't know which direction to go. Its GPS is all messed up. When, the, when they shall go, I'll spread my net on them. I'll bring them down like fowls of the heavens. I'll chastise them. Their congregation hath heard. Woe to them, for they fled from me. Destruction to them, for they've transgressed to me. Though I've redeemed them, they've spoken lies against me. And they've not cried to me with their heart. When they wailed on their beds, they assembled themselves for grain and wine, and they rebel against me. Though I've bound and strengthened their arms, yet they do imagine this mischief against me. The picture here is a people that think that they're still able to do international politics, and they're looking for military alliances, either with Egypt against Assyria or Assyria against Egypt, and they're zooming over here and zooming over there, and God made it very clear that wasn't what his will was at all. They're looking to everyone and anyone but God. We can see this in our modern times with the Philippines, right? You know that dictator down there, boy, he was all in for China. Just do away with the U.S. Now he's starting to see China. Now he jumped ship and now we're going to have military bases in there again. He's on our side. And that's the problem with little nations, right? They they're always looking for somebody against the other guy. Some, they'll go one way or the other way to protect them against Poland had the same problem and, and, uh, because of its size. But here they're looking everywhere to, but to God for security and stability. They have an inability to stand alone, which was what God wanted them to do. They lost their capacity to be different. They wanted to be like the nations instead, uh, instead of being separate from the nations. And they wanted these alliances. Egypt is mentioned 13 times in Hosea, Assyria 10 times. And they had these vain political hopes. And the people they got in alliance with were the very ones that did them in. When you replace God with something else or someone else, you never better yourself. How many people have I saw leave the Lord and what they leave him for, they'd never better themselves ever. It's kind of shocking. You could almost write a book about it. Fifth, God describes them like a bow that doesn't shoot. That's the last description. And it's a very, very powerful one. He says in verse uh, 16, They return, but not to the Most High. They're like a deceitful bow. Their princes shall fall by the sword for the rage of their tongue. This shall be their derision in the land of Egypt. Now, commentators on Hosea take this two ways. I'm not sure which one is the right one. But, but they do seem to take it two ways. One, it, there's, it's like a bow that's too loose. The, the, the string on the bow is too loose. And it, 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 therefore, it doesn't shoot at all. Uh, and you're not able to get any, the, no, no momentum for the arrow. The other is that the bow itself is somehow warped. And it'll get the arrow downrange, but it misses the target. It's off center. It's a deceitful bow. I, I have a pellet gun at home. My son got it for Christmas, and it was a really nice Chinese, nice wood pellet gun. There is no way I can fix the sights. I can't get the sights. It shoots high right, I mean way high right, and I can't fix the sights on it. They will not adjust. Now maybe somebody knows something I don't know, but I could never get it to adjust. So you can't get it into it, you know. And I've tried to shoot an unmentioned bird with that thing. It's hard enough to shoot that particular bird with a pellet uh, uh, when, it's, when you've uh, got a good sight. But if it's high right a couple of inches, it's really hard. And so it's basically useless. I don't even know where it is. It's somewhere in my house collecting dust because I gave up on it. And I've had a lot cheaper pellet guns over the years that 
did never had that problem, but that one does. So if it's a deceitful bow and it doesn't shoot right, or if you can't shoot at all, that's bad. That's really bad. Derek Kidner said about this deceitful bow, it's perhaps the most serious of all. For a weapon may imply life or death situation. In which failure spells the end of everything. In a life or death situation, you want a weapon that works. Not one that won't shoot. Or shoots crooked. You don't want your gun to jam, right? You don't want that. And in the end, for us, everything is life or death in this world. The issues are much more serious than we imagine. The stakes could not be higher. You know, in the movies, there's often a gunfight that settles everything. Is the hero going to die or is the hero going to win? Or is the hero going to win and die? Uh, both and all of that. Everything is on that one battle. But the picture here is life is battle. And if you can't, if, you're, if you have a weapon that doesn't shoot straight, that's very, very serious. To be ineffective in battle is to be dead. And that's the picture. Now here's a nation that's betrayed and belittled everything concerning the one they owed the most to. What a mark of decadence. You owe everything to this one person and you, you betray them and belittle them and turn from them. And uh, what a sad sight. Now, how does all this apply to us? Remember, Jesus Christ is the God of heaven. And when we have God's searching eyes in Hosea 7 to Israel, it's the eyes of Jesus. Really. And so let's, let's put a Christian tag on this. We're not a rabbi, we're a pastor. And let's think about Jesus Christ and us. Number one, the Lord Jesus Christ sees sins we don't see. Revelation 2 and 3, pretty clear, right? Our sins aren't a surprise to him. He's got those eyes of fire. Two, the Lord Jesus Christ knows precisely what his people are like. He's got these word pictures. He not only sees it, he's got it analyzed and diagnosed and, and so forth. Three, he has thoroughly diagnosed us. Um, and yet he wants to save us from our sins. He came here to save us from those sins he knows all about. All of us have taken on a job that ended up being more work than we expected or cost more than we thought it was going to cost. I think most household projects are that way. They take longer and they cost more. I think that's a rule, right? It's going to take longer and cost more. Because why? We're not omniscient. And you dig into a project and you find out there's some other problem underneath the problem and then there's another problem and you fix one thing, car repairs do that sometimes, right? You take it in for one little thing and it's $700 because there's something else. There's that something else. The Lord Jesus knows the something else. He knows how bad it is. He knows. But he took on the job. He knew Peter. When Peter said, depart from me for I'm a sinful man, O Lord, Peter was basically saying, I'm not as good as you think I am. And Jesus is saying, you're a lot worse than you think you are, but I want you to follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. 
Jesus was under no delusions when he died for our sins. He died for our sins because we had sins and he knew all about them. And that same Jesus is coming for us. Knowing everything. Knowing the denial of Peter. Knowing all the faults of the apostles. He said, uh, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Isn't that amazing? You see, Jesus has a relationship with Israel and Jesus has a relationship with us. It's the same Jesus. And uh, there's nothing special about Israel's sins. We have the same sins. And yet the Lord loves us anyway, is coming for us anyway, died for us anyway. It's an amazing, amazing thing. So this, this incapability of moral and spiritual responsibility, this is radical on their part, inattentiveness to separation, ignorance of their decline, uh, uh, inability to stand alone, ineffectiveness in spiritual warfare. That's not a very good picture, is it? You, when you read this, you know, I'd be tempted to use the expression, what good are you? <laughs> what good are you? And yet, here is our Lord, and when he sees the church, he washes it with the washing of the water of the word that we might be without spot and blemish. He knows. No surprises here. What a wonderful thing. Well, next week, we're going to see chapter 8. This is that famous chapter with they've, uh, uh, where they reap the whirlwind. That's one of the most famous expressions in Hosea. And we'll look at that next time. But I hope this has been a challenge and blessing to you. And uh, um, thank God for the holy eyes of our blessed Lord. And thank God for the love of our blessed Lord that loves us anyway. Father, thank you for who you are and who we are in Christ. And as we study Hosea, we're amazed at the accuracy and of your understanding of your wayward people. And you know exactly what the case really is. You know us better than our, we know ourselves. You know us better than others know us. You know us in a way that no one knows us except yourself. And yet, as the book of Hosea clearly teaches, there's a deep love there anyway. So many people criticize the God of the Bible and never ponder his love. We thank you we can do that in this book. And many times in life we don't understand what you're doing, but we're often in the dark about what you're doing, but we're not in the dark about you when we ponder this attribute. In Jesus' name, amen.